questions and we now move on to topical questions and I call Ms Rosaline McCorley. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he can explain the delay in setting up a task force to uh, address the issue of home repossessions which have increased by 20% this year according to Housing Rights Service? Um, the issue of uh, supporting people whose homes are in danger of being repossessed um, is one that has been very much in our mind, has been raised in this chamber on, on a number of occasions. Um, I believe that the support that we're giving at the moment through um, the Housing Rights Service and the additional support, uh, financial support that was given there to them to enable them to support people in those positions um, has been particularly important. And there's a clear difference between folk who effectively bury their heads in the sand and hope that a terrible situation will go away, and those who face up to it and take legal advice and get uh, practical advice from the Housing Rights Service. Um, the, the clear difference there are people arriving in the court and about to lose their house and then maybe an intervention at the last minute. The key thing is to get in touch with the Housing Rights Service at a very early stage. Um, we keep the situation constantly um, under review as to um, what additional measures might need to be taken. And that's something that certainly uh, we haven't uh, forgotten about or neglected in any way. But I would encourage people primarily to approach it through that particular method of the, using the, the services of the Housing Rights Service. Ms. Rosalind McCarley for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, can I ask the Minister what alternatives uh, from other jurisdictions has he examined in order to seek a remedy to this issue? There are a, a number of options that were mentioned in the past where financial interventions were talked about. Um, but when you look at the scope of the problem and the extent of the, the, the financial difficulty of the individual and scale that up, um, it would be possible to help, in practical terms, a very small number of people, whereas the, the problem, as the member well knows, is, is, uh, affects several hundred, number of hundreds of people each year. Um, and therefore, whilst we have looked at other options elsewhere, the, the, the primary response has to be the one that we're adopting at the moment, but as I say, this is something we do keep under review. Thank you, and I call Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, um, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, given the evidence to the DSD inquiry on Thursday past, uh, with regards to a letter of the 24th of May 2012 to the chair of the committee, did you mislead the committee? Um, there is a process being taken forward by the committee at the moment. Um, there were a number of submissions made uh, last Thursday. There will be further submissions made this Thursday. Um, I am due, uh, due to come in, um, to uh, the committee later on in the month of uh, December. I think it is the 12th of December. And at that point, I will, in fact, be uh, giving a submission to the committee. I think it would be wrong and premature to address it until I had the courtesy of giving that to the committee. Council Deputy Speaker, it's a very simple question to the Minister. Did he mislead the committee? I think we should note he hasn't answered the question. Why, Minister, did you give an instruction uh, to a civil servant to change the content of that letter? Um, I don't know if the member has difficulty understanding plain English, but uh, I simply said there, uh, in response to the first point, that I would uh, make the uh, information available to the committee on the 12th of December when I go to the committee and I intend in response to your second question to give the answer to that in due course as well. Um, it's a very simple answer. It will be given on the 12th of December and I just ask the member to have a little bit of patience. I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, in light of comments by the new energy regulator today and that high energy costs are, are here to stay, can I ask the Minister, can he assure me that all is being done uh, in his power to assist those who are most in need to heat their homes? Um, I can't thank the member for, for the question. The fact is that in Northern Ireland, according to the House Conditions Survey, um, the fuel poverty affects 42 per cent. That's about 295,000 households in Northern Ireland. Um, and as the member is aware, um, Fuel poverty arises really from income level, fuel cost and energy efficiency. 
Um, we have had the statement uh, from the regulator uh, today in regard to the cost of energy in Northern Ireland and the fact that it is set to remain high into the foreseeable future. We can do something, I suppose, about income to a limited extent. My department uh, does run a very extensive um, benefit uptake programme, and that benefit uptake programme uh, will, uh, again this year as it has done in previous years, uh, make a substantial difference to quite a number of vulnerable people who are on low incomes. But um, the other main area of work that we have is in terms of energy efficiency of homes. We have the warm home scheme, uh, the boiler replacement scheme, and those really do make a difference. Um, the affordable warmth pilot, again, that we're uh, taking forward. And then also it's important to remember that those aged 60 and over are entitled to a winter fuel payment. So the um, work that we're doing in terms of delivering um, some financial support through benefit uptake and through the winter fuel payment and the energy efficiency are the two principal areas that we can work on. And I hope that um, we will see uh, a reduction in fuel poverty as we see our homes in Northern Ireland made more energy efficient. Mr Anderson, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you. Um, can I thank the Minister for that response? The, the Minister will know that I recently raised the energy efficiency of homes with him, especially those that are single wall dwellings. Can he provide me with an assurance that these types of dwellings will be made a priority in any forward work programme? Um, I've certainly been looking at this issue for some time now um, since I became aware that there were uh, around 5,000 housing executive properties across Northern Ireland that were of no fines construction, um, most of them constructed from a single uh, skin of concrete uh, and no cavity. Um, there is some work being taken forward at the moment. We have a, a housing side of a set up a working group to progress a strategic approach to look at the thermal performance of all housing executive no fine stock. And I recently visited Spring Farm in Antrim, where uh, I met the consortium of the Technology Strategy Board to view the no fines houses in that estate and discuss the methods that could be used in providing external insulation to the seven properties that are there in the pilot. And the lessons that will be learned over the coming year through that pilot will not just benefit people in Northern Ireland, but people throughout the United Kingdom, because the Technology Strategy Board um, and the experts that have been brought across from GB to look at this um, are, are really operating a pilot for the whole of the United Kingdom. I might also add that um, early next month I'm proposing to uh, visit the Leonardo Project in Germany to see for myself a successful retrofit scheme uh, that was carried out there. Um, did have the opportunity some months ago of seeing retrofit carried out in Liverpool. The, the German scheme is somewhat different. There are lessons to be learned, but this is something that I have made a priority. I'm sure, like the member, I'm aware of many homes in my own constituency uh, that suffer from this particular problem. Thank you. And I call Mr David Hildreth. Thank you, Mr uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, do you have any concerns uh, that delays to the Welfare Reform Bill will place uh, the, his department's ability to administer and provide benefits to the most vulnerable at risk? The member makes a very important point here, and one that has been largely overlooked in general comment and in particular in the media. Because when we talk about welfare reform and delays, we tend to think in terms of the recent visit by Mike Penning and the point he made in terms of financial penalties that would impact on the Northern Ireland block grant. Uh, but there is more to it than that because potentially it can also have uh, an impact on the viability of a number of jobs that we have in Northern Ireland providing services to the rest of the United Kingdom um, in, in uh, the delivery of welfare. There's also this point that's been made there um, that, as regards this, I'm really concerned, I have to say, that delays to the welfare bill are already resulting in operational difficulties due to the need to put in place clerical workarounds as the two benefit systems begin to diverge. So there are practical difficulties as well, and that's putting at risk the Social Security Agency's ability to administer and provide benefits, and the agency is already incurring additional costs. At the moment, modest, but they will very quickly rack up. I have also written to ministerial colleagues advising them of the operational impact resulting from the introduction in GB of the new mandatory reconsideration process, which went live in GB on the 20th of October. This meant that certain benefit decision notifications 
issued to claimants in Northern Ireland contain incorrect information on how to dispute their decision. So in order to ensure that they get the correct information, an insert has had to be included with the notifications issued to Northern Ireland claimants, and the agency has incurred additional costs of some £90,000 at this juncture over that single point. So it's important not just for the penalty issue to be kept in mind, and that's a hugely important one, as, uh, as uh, the um, DWP minister pointed out, um, but there's also these practical difficulties that are detrimental to claimants in Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Mr Hildreds for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, but going back to the divergence, are we reliant on GBIT systems uh, to deliver benefits here in Northern Ireland? I must apologise to the member. I, I got slightly distracted there uh, in one sense. It's a point that should have made there. Absolutely. We are totally dependent in Northern Ireland on the, the IT system throughout the rest of the United Kingdom. There is no possibility of Northern Ireland going it alone and devising its own IT system for um, welfare payments. Um, it would be uh, totally impossible. The cost would be astronomical, and it would be simply uh, totally destructive to the Northern Ireland block grant in terms of the cost of it. How we could do it, I just could not imagine, and anybody who thinks we could would be very much mistaken. It is a system that spreads right across the UK, and we are part of it. I call Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, the term eviction repossession is a very emotive term, reminiscent of Ireland a couple of hundred years ago. But unfortunately, between June and September, the number of people who have had their homes repossessed has increased by 20 per cent over the same period last year. Will the Minister set up a task force to mitigate against the worst aspects of something that I thought we had left behind hundreds of years ago? Um, I'm not sure what the procedure is in the Assembly for being asked the same question that you have already dealt with. Uh, I was thought if someone had already asked a question, the next person who had thought of asking it would ask a different question. But uh, the question was already asked there by uh, Ms McCourty earlier on, and I would refer the member to the answer which I gave to her. No apology whatsoever to the Minister for asking a question, which is very close. I'm not sure if the Minister has ever been at an eviction. It's not nice, but here's my supplementary. And the supplementary is... The Housing Strategy Action Plan for 2012-2017 commits you, Minister, to creating a working group to mitigate against the effects of repossession on individuals and families. Will you now implement it, please? As I indicated, or just, I hope I indicated previously, it's an issue that we are constantly reviewing, constantly working on. And um, I said earlier, there are welcoming, I would welcome at any time ideas from any individuals as to how uh, we might do things more differently, how we might do them better. Uh, if the member has any proposals that he wants to bring forward, I will be more than happy to receive them and to listen to them. I call Ms. Michelle Michael Bean. Thank you, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker. Could the Minister advise whether the bid for public realm funding for Newton Arts has been successful? Um, I'm uh, pleased to uh, inform the member that uh, yes, the answer is that there will be an announcement very shortly. The public realm scheme in uh, Newton Ards, which was delayed in the past for various reasons, has now uh, been uh, brought forward. It's an extensive scheme, five and a half million pounds, will bring considerable benefit to Newton Ards, uh, and I'm happy to confirm to him we've been making an announcement very shortly. Ms. McLevin for a very quick supplementary. Thank you very much. I obviously welcome the Minister's announcement and also the recent news that Cumber had also received £2.4 million, million funding for Public Realm. Can the Minister agree that improvements such as Public Realm can be an economic catalyst for small towns? There, there's very clear evidence that Public Realm work as part of a wider package of measures in a town centre can make a real difference to the town centre. Um, Revitalisation schemes uh, for the shops nearby uh, can often add to that, and generally a public realm scheme emerges out of uh, a master plan for the town centre, which is a great opportunity for all those, whether it be the local authority, the local traders and business people, and uh, my own officials, to work together to see what is the best way forward for that particular town centre. 
Um, challenging time for town centres, very challenging indeed. Um, there were recent figures quoted uh, in terms of empty properties, and we need to boost the town centres to make them more attractive, greater footfall, more people in them, more people shopping, and therefore greater viability for, for the traders. Thank you, Minister. And that brings us to an end to the period for topical questions. And